Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, fall and annual general meeting for BC Alpine. Thanks for coming, and as you know, we have a tight, tight uh, time constraint, so without further ado, I'll introduce the first, uh, our first guest speaker, Steve Norris, Vice President of Sport for Wind Sport Canada. He's a pro professor at the University of Calgary and Mount Royal University, and he's an advisor to Max Gardner, Chair of Alpine Canada, and the head coaches of Alpine Canada. So, Steve, you're up. Thank you. <coughs> well, good morning. Thank you very much to you, Bruce, um, for inviting me to have the opportunity of speaking with you today. I'm going to talk about a number of subjects, but essentially will be housed around the age change that's taking place uh, next year, um, what we're thinking about doing in terms of uh, suggestions for you at the uh, provincial level, and also we'll have a quick look at uh, what one of our competitors has already started to do. Where in the game? So, I called it a little bit about uh, don't sweat the snow stuff, because obviously when change uh, occurs, um, one of the things that happens is people get very worried about change. But I would caution you on that aspect. Change is just an aspect of life. I look in the mirror every morning, and I've changed considerably over the last few years. The rules in sports change, performance changes, technology changes, etc, etc. It's just the facts. You as an organisation, whether it's at a club level, the PSO, or beyond, need to understand that change is just a matter of fact. And you either live and die by your flexibility and capacity for that, or you'll need to really reinvest your th thinking processes, your thought processes, around that aspect. There's nothing threatening around the FIS rule changes in terms of the age. There is only upside, ultimately. So, starting in the 2012-2013 season, as you know, there are a number of things that are going on. And the first reaction, of course, is, oh my God, another rule change, some ramifications, and perhaps a focus just on the short term. Perhaps you've got some gaps in particular age groups right now. Or perhaps there are some implications around some of the other equipment changes that are going on. These are just sent to challenge us a little bit in the short term. And what are short term changes gradually become the norm for the future. You have to move beyond these very clearly. So apart from this aspect of there's going to be some kind of change, I'm a rather cynical person when it comes to this type of stuff particularly where it involves our children. Because most of the time, it's us adults that seem to put obstacles and barriers and log jams in the way of the actual programming that we put in place. Whether it's from a particular bias, a particular level of understanding or misunderstanding of the information, or particular challenges that you face in your own particular jurisdiction without necessarily looking at the whole. And I'm coming at you pretty hard. I'm not going to pull any punches, it's not my job. My job ultimately is to deal with performance sports where there can be no excuses ultimately. So once we've all said that, in terms of the aspects around the rule changes, we can take a, a deep breath and understand some of the reality around actually what is going on. So yes, FIS entry at 16 years now, up one year from 15 years of age currently. We're going to see a World Junior Championships at the U21 level. This is following along in line with many other leading sports. Sports with similar ages of ultimate performance have actually raised even further than this. Cross country skiing, with the addition of the U23 Championships on top of their Junior Championships. You're not alone. What is the main purpose of this? Well, interestingly enough, despite what you might think, one of the key issues is this. 
It allows much greater maturation time, at least one year, prior to FIS entry. This is a good thing. It may propose some challenges for us as adults, but for the youngsters that we have a responsibility to, it's a good thing. We don't need to rush them. We can get back to some of the basics. They have an extra year. We can perhaps start to deal with perhaps some of the relative age effects. We see in many sports where early developers surpass the performance levels of the later developers and have a distinct advantage, and often as not, we end up just with them left in the system. And the youngsters who develop later have been discouraged because of the adult fixation of looking at short-term competitive outcomes in meaningless age group <coughs> results. You have to remember that in the vast majority of jurisdictions of age group sport, across all disciplines of both genders, 85 to 96% of the age group champions are not the people that win at the senior level. No such thing as an 8-year-old champion, a 10-year-old champion, or a 12-year-old champion. Those are redundant concepts. You may see the glimmers of some underlying gifts and abilities, for sure. But there are no guarantees, and that is well born out of the sports science literature in the area of talent identification and future high-level performance. The parents will do well to read much of the growing literature in the area of giftedness and attitude talent identification in all jurisdictions, from the arts, science, and certainly sport. It is unfortunate in sport, and particularly age group sport, that we don't follow our own gut instincts, or indeed the actual mechanisms that are in place in much of academia and the arts. From their sports schools, the academies, the Juilliard, the Royal Ballet School, and why we ignore those when it comes to this area of age group sports, where everyone and their dog seems to have an opinion, whether it's based on fact or not. We wouldn't dream of doing the same type of structures in academia and arts that we impose on our youngsters in sport. Why is it we understand that even at the beginning levels of academia, we go from grade 1 to grade 12, it takes 12 years. There is a curriculum that's matched to the age and development of the youngsters year by year by year. The examination process, aka competition, is matched to the developmental process of the youngsters and that curriculum. And it is taught at every stage by a fully qualified teacher slash coach. And yet in age group sport, we often put our most precious commodity, our six-year-olds to our 12-year-olds, in the hands of the least qualified, least experienced, and least paid, if at all, people. And worse still, we expect them to move rapidly through the system. And often as not, we use an examination procedure that is a watered-down version of the adult system. This is a pathetic behavior. Now this doesn't detract from the enormous hours that our volunteers put into sport. We just need to make sure they have the best possible guidance, that there is technical leadership at the club level, at the regional level, at the PSO level, to provide overall direction without stifling anyone's creativity. We don't need every club to be a clone of every other club. We want to create avenues for competition, reflecting the different geographical and economic and obviously environmental conditions of each club, from the small hills to the big hills, to the clubs close to large urban centres to those out in the rural areas. And that goes across the rest of Canada. But you have to understand that we need to develop very much a Canadian way, a great deal of discussion has gone into that concept at Alpine Canada over the last few years. One of the key things you need to understand is that the youngster, as they grow, is not a miniature adult. 
This is a color schematic of brain development from about five years of age all the way through the 17 years of age. And as the brain changes in color towards that more indigo color, that is showing a maturation, particularly of the frontal cortex and the frontal lobe. These are extremely important areas for future and subsequent emotional control, decision making, etc., etc., all of which are important not only in life, but certainly in high performance sport, and certainly in a sport where you're making decisions at the millisecond level. A six year old is not half a 12 year old. By the same token, a 12 year old is not half a 24 year old. It is not simply, similar, it's not simply a linear progression in terms of development. It's much more organic than that. Experience is extremely important. So although we talk in linear models, grade one to grade 12, understand it's a more bludgeoning effect as the youngster gains experience all the time. The key issue if you focus on skiing is, are you ensuring that that level of experience is growing at the rate it should do? Or are you narrowing it because of your own myopic view of what alpine skiing actually is, as opposed to that singular race at the World Cup level? There is no excuse for a lack of creativity and imagination when it comes to instruction and coaching in the world of alpine skiing. You have a rich tapestry of environmental lands, those hills, that are yours for the taking. You don't simply have to narrow it down by putting a bunch of gates down the middle of a particular run. That would be a massive mistake. There's a time and place for that. It's part of the process. So you have huge opportunity as far as I'm concerned. Huge opportunity to spread your wings and certainly for BC to be an absolute leader in this particular sport. I throw the gauntlet down to you. We have to stop the madness. This is an extremely expensive sport. Extremely expensive. And it gets expensive very quickly unless you understand what you're really trying to do. To my way of thinking, if you can't ski on a set of, I don't know, six foot two by fours in plimsolls, then it doesn't matter what equipment we put you on. If you can't control those planks of wood, it doesn't matter. Can you ski any time, any place, under any condition, and be in total control of those skis? After all, they didn't want to go down a hill all by themselves. The issue is, are you building the repertoire of skill sets in these youngsters that they can A, make the right decisions, and B, control those skis optimally? A number of years ago, a group of us stood on our soapbox and put together just a generic guide, and it's simply that a framework, a guide. Again, it doesn't stifle anyone's creativity. It doesn't limit you. It's a framework, nothing more. I would fully expect it to evolve radically over the first 10 years of its existence as knowledge improves around child and youth development, training methodology, your attitudes around what constitutes an alpine ski racer as they develop. So this particular document is nothing more than a collection of thoughts to help steer you, promote discussion, promote argument. There is nothing wrong with dissent and argument if it is used productively to push and improve things. The very existence of the document has created a lot of discussion. These are good things. <coughs> One thing I would like you to consider is this particular diagram. 
And I put this together actually from Mike's garden back in um, the early spring in preparation for the ACA summit in Kananaskis. And he asked me if I were really looking at a blank piece of paper and starting to formulate a plan for the Canadian way, how might I do things? And what you're looking at here on the vertical axis is a schematic representation of the age groups, okay, from K1 through to the senior World Cup level. And then horizontally, it's how you might position sequentially the type of skiing and the examination that reflects not only the skill set of the youngsters, but growth and maturation as well. So where does strength and power really come into the fold? But it's not really that apparent in a bunch of six-year-olds to a bunch of 11-year-olds. You have to get well past the growth curve. You need things like testosterone in abundant quantities to allow for things such as hypertrophy increase in muscle mass to take place. That's not really going to come to the fore until well after the secondary growth spurt, the main growth spurt through puberty has occurred in males or females. So this has implications when you're dealing with loading forces or even landing forces. The ability to actually steer a ski under high load, to deal with the unloading of the ski. The suggestion is, in the early years, is to be able to ski the entire mountain over time, build the confidence. Gradually from there, and this may sound like sacrilege to you, but since it stems nicely from the ability to ski the whole mountain and builds a repertoire of skills, is the concept of what you might see as recognizable ski costs. These are all highly transferable skills. Jumping, turning, decision making when actually faced with someone right in front of you. Something that is not typically present, obviously, in alpine ski racing itself. But that the ability to make a decision and a move when you see something from a terrain point of view right in front of you obviously has the same kind of capability. And that ability to make decisions on the fly with random events coming at you, unpredictable. Very important. And the brain is learning those all the way through. And then we go on. Slug. Well poised. Why? Because every skier needs to be able to turn and turn effectively. Not just turn, but turn effectively, efficiently, optimally. <coughs> all the type of things that if we were in racing school in motor racing, we would learn. And the parallels between high performance motor racing and high performance sailing and alpine skiing are very, very clear. Everyone knows in motor racing, you brake with the wheels straight, you accelerate with the wheels straight. You choose the right line, there is an optimal line. What happens to you when you're offline and the decision making for the next apex and so forth and so forth. The only difference in a motor car, of course, is you have the added advantage of being able to use the power of the engine. You're in a gravity sport. You can't afford to squander that engine. Time lost is hard to make up when you have a finite distance that you have to travel. And then as we move out, should we move to the more powerful disciplines, the disciplines that actually require major input in terms of force loading. And obviously as the ages go up, you can understand why there is a suggestion that we don't necessarily have to focus on these until somewhat later. But you have to introduce them before the exam comes out at a suitable time. So there's a sequential progression that you start training for something well in advance of when the exam is going to occur, perhaps even age groups below. So there's a process here. And so this diagram was created purely as a discussion point. And then other things that are around assumptions to this are how we course set and how course setting evolves for the age and competency of the skiers. I went to a race, a K2 race, a number of years ago at Big White. And there was a particular crux area of the particular course that I was watching where if I was really harsh with the field, 
close to 90, 85-90% of the field couldn't effectively negotiate this part of the course, not from a racing point of view, they survived it. But the exam wasn't relevant. And I guarantee you, if we went right across the country, we would see the same type of stuff. So as we learn to course set, is the exam relevant to the target audience? Is it a suitable challenge to push the equipment, age and competency? This is one area clearly that drives up costs. Now obviously we are at the behest to some degree of, of the FIS, but domestically we could set whatever rules we want. I caution us as an Alpine community, if we constantly just are prepared to follow Europe, we are destined not simply to be that followers. We have a vast country with massive geography, a relatively small population of skiers. We cannot simply follow a model that doesn't fit. We have to find something that's relevant for us. Worse still, what is relevant for BC is not necessarily what is relevant for Southern Ontario. So it's not one size fits all. Different season lengths, different terrain, different populations. We need to think about international benchmarking. Sooner or later we have to step away from BC, we have to step away from Canada and compare very distinct points in our developmental pathway with other countries. How are we doing? What does that look like? Because that involves cost. You're either going to subsidize people coming here, or you're going to have to travel. One thing you need to do, of course, is not always necessarily travel west-east around the globe, but perhaps north-south. And perhaps you'll do that to a strategic level already, where you use the United States at times for benchmarking, if it's suitable for you. Certainly for Ontario and Quebec, it can be. Do you have yearly and multi-year plans that are actually coherent with your long-term objectives? Are you tracking your assets? Do you really know all the demographics? Do you know your retention rates and your conversion rates? Do you have a unit cost per skier as they come through the system? Are you striving not only to reduce those, but to improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of your program? And within that, are you really, really pushing the envelope when it comes to the quality of basic instruction and coaching in this province? That is the absolute number one critical factor. What you put in, is what you will get out. So what about the skiers? We talked about us as adults driving the program. What about them with this rule change? Has anything really changed for them? Well, I would actually argue, no, certainly nothing bad. They've been given a bit of breathing room, a bit of a tough chance for us adults to be a bit patient with them to really look at them, assuming we actually have a good model of what we're trying to achieve with them. What should the technical competency of a 10-year-old look like? What is your technical checklist at age 10? <coughs> and I'm not simply looking at Husky Snow Stars now, I mean beyond that. What does it look like? What should the average kid look like? What should the top 10% in any particular age base? What would be the lowest common denominator? Do you have a clear understanding of that? And then at 11 and 12 and 13 and 14. And what's the repertoire system for those who are a little bit behind the curve at one particular age? What does your drop off rate look like in terms of retention year on year, age group on age group? And you better have an understanding of the effect of economics on that particular aspect. And one of the biggest things that you have control over, aside from the equipment, is travel. How much travel is really needed? I 
and see many schools traveling around. They don't say to a school that's in the lower mainland, I don't know, let's go up to Prince George this week. Let's go and, I don't know, study English up in Prince George. So why are we doing that? Oh, because of the exam. Oh, well, let's go and have an exam in English up in Prince George. Do you see academia doing that? No. Why? Because they've got good benchmarking systems. They understand. Certainly they bring groups, groups together every so often. Same in the arts. Recitals. But they don't do it all the time. And that starts with the environment we as coaches and our clubs create. Students of the sport, are you? Do you understand that with this particular slope, under reasonable conditions, with this length of the course, with these number of gates, this is roughly the range of time that I would expect a bunch of 12-year-olds to ski down that course. Or the same course, 14-year-olds, or 16-year-olds. You can't answer those questions. I'll come at you hard and I'll say, I don't know how you go. You look at motor racing. They would be able to tell you roughly the lap times so for every class of car on the same course. Bobsleigh, skeleton, luge, the age group times, the World Cup times. Can't do 53 seconds on that course in two man bobsleigh in Calgary? Forget about it. On the other hand, at 57 seconds, for a youngster, pretty good. At 53, Got to be there if you want to be on the World Cup. So what's it look like? You'll come at me and say, oh, but the conditions differ. It's not the same. Ball honking. Ball honking. It's just your level of variance is somewhat wider than some of these more controlled sports. That's all. That's what it means to be a student of your sport. Not just the cursory stats. Not simply looking at placement. You're in a time sport. What's the percentage back by age group, by discipline, of the BC skiers compared to the rest of the country? Are we 1% back? Are we 3% back? Are we 5% back year on year? Do you know this? Food for thought. Getting back to the youngsters. Nothing's changed too much, it's all been positive, an extra year doesn't change the journey, it's still a long and a hard one if they're going to aspire to the dream, putting on the Canada jacket and competing for Canada at some international event of significance, lots of international events of insignificance that we seem to spend a lot of money on. The essential problem to be solved remains. It's pretty simple. Canada has to do three seamlessly related things, ultimately. Safely, yet realistically and competitively, produce year on year youngsters 9 to 13 who can ski well technically. That's the fundamental thing. Okay? So after a period of progression, from whatever age they started, three, four, five, six years of age, whatever it was, by the time they get into this envelope, 9 to 13 years of age, have we set the grounding that they can ski any time, any place, anywhere, any conditions, to the technical level that you would expect of someone that is within the performance envelope that can move on effectively. And why do we say that? Because typically, plus or minus, because I'm going to use a chronological age here, we have to understand individual variants. At around 14 years of age, you will see the movement patterns laid down that you will see a decade to a decade and a half later. The only difference is they may not have the same level of competency around decision making. They certainly won't have the same endurance, strength and power that they will in their late teens and through their 20s. But from a technical point of view, they should be able to do everything. So what's that look like? What's your library of video look like for those 14 year olds? 
do you compare your 14-year-olds with the rest of the world's 14-year-olds? We need to make sure that our youth, moving on, 14 to 17 years old, who can ski well, but now also ski fast. And you can quantify what you mean by fast, and you better be benchmarking that again with the performance envelope of not only the rest of Canada, but the rest of the world, if you're serious. And then finally, we have to produce international races at the junior and senior level. And I'm not talking about people that languish around somewhere between 40th and 60th in the world. I'll be blunt with you. I'm fed up of seeing people 40th to 60th in the world. As though that is some kind of badge of honour. Yes, they're good seniors. whoop de whoop Very happy. Not detracting what they've done as a competition from that standpoint, but do not pretend for one minute that this is sufficient if you truly want to compete, compete against the world's best. Why is it that on any given Sunday, in some of these speed events, the same 15 to 20 skiers rush down a mountain with slightly varying terrain and length within a few one hundredths of a second of each other. And it's the same 15 to 20. No matter what the conditions, no excuse. And yet people will always tell me, oh, no, there's so much variability in any sort of the snow sports. Really? It's like cross-country skiing. I'm constantly told the same thing. But here's a stat for you in cross-country skiing. Ski somewhere between 6.7 to 7 meters per second, uphill, downhill, under any conditions and at any altitude below the 2,000 meter fist ceiling. And I guarantee you're going to be in the top flight of the world's cross country skiers. And if you can't do that, you won't be. It's simple. And here's another stat for you. To be able to ski at 6.7 meters to 7 meters per second, uphill, downhill, at any <coughs> elevation, under any conditions, you need to be able to run a 10K, typically under 33 minutes, and if possible, under 31 minutes as a male. And I don't care how good a skier you are, technically, if you can't run that fast, you're not going 6.7 meters to 7 meters per second when we give you a set of skinny skis. So you start to understand the concept of the metrics that are important, the supporting metrics. So what are the supporting metrics in alpine skiing? How much strength, how much suppleness, how much agility, how much athletic capability is required? What about the decision-making components? It's like a set of Russian dolls. You basically peel back one doll, one doll, one doll, until you finally get to the real crux. That's what it means to be a student of your sport. In my research for Max over the course of um, the last 18 months, <coughs> I stumbled across this particular table that I'm going to show you from our competition to the south, the United States of America, the United States Ski and Snow Association. They had this on their website back in March. <coughs> Alpine age change in planning already up. So, by the fact it was actually on their public website, they had obviously already had the discussion and planned out. And they did come up with this in just a weekend. They thought about it. And interestingly enough, that little diagram that I produced, very, very similar to the concept that they had. And I assure you, I hadn't seen this at that time. Here the season, the only age groups. Here's the training system focus. Here's the type of competition and whether or not they're going to bother using a ranking system in the younger age groups. You notice how late that actually starts. But notice down here, U10, player and games, innovative motor and technical skill, focus on slalom GS combination type events. In other words, the whole hill, ski cross, slalom, just like we've suggested. Students of your sport, 
You don't have to copy the opposition, but you need to understand what they're doing. Beg, borrow, steal, but also innovate. Understanding and consolidating the Canadian way, much of what I said to you this morning, is really about building or enhancing the things that you already do to make sure we don't simply follow. You don't simply follow other parts of the country either. Find the BC way within the Canadian way. The Alpine ski culture we create, foster and nurture is our responsibility. We have no one else to blame or no one else to pat on the back for what we create. It is ours. And in BC, it is yours. Certainly there are some external influences that come out. It's always easy to point at an NSO or another province or even another country. But let's develop something strong, stable, with a critical review process so that you can constantly and appropriately, at key moments in time, come back and review how you're doing against clearly defined and transparent metrics. And make sure those metrics are relevant to what you're trying to do. For the children and the youngsters, you need to understand that the science and sociological research in the area of going after any endeavor, but certainly in the world of sport, the number one reason children and youth stay in sport is having fun. If you look at the last two major surveys of team sports, particularly around hockey in North America, all the way from initiation to major junior, the number one reason for staying in hockey is having fun. The number one reason for leaving hockey, not having fun. You want these youngsters to go through a decade, two decades of progress in this particular sport, they better have some clear intrinsic motivation to stay with it. Challenging themselves is part of how youngster grows. It's one reason where your instructors, particularly in those early developmental years, better be able to demonstrate very, very effectively because the children are watching every step. When they go free skiing with their parents, have you even given the parents some pointers? Because you can't assume that the parents execute everything perfectly. Creative, fun, that kid was having fun. Was it a dance class? No, just doing it for the heck of it. Had some encouragement because of reward, applause, happy faces from the, from the adults around? Certainly. Did they have to give him a medal to do this? Did he have to graduate from kindergarten to do this? The reason why I mention that is as you start to bring in reward systems, you better make sure that the reward system is allied to the concept of intrinsic motivation. We have moved as adults where you can't put a child into anything without giving them meaningless baubles at expense for absolutely achieving next to nothing. I put my daughter into the minor soccer last year, my little town just west of Calgary. They gave her a medal, a basket of 
goodies, which is basically teeth, uh, stuff that rotted teeth, after eight weeks of outdoor soccer for a seven-year-old for turning up. For turning up. She graduates from each year of school, starting from kindergarten, a big ceremony. Who is that for? Not the kids. It's us. We are out of control. We need to start valuing and instilling in our youngsters, valuing for having achieved something, accomplished something. Not starting to reward things which are meaningless, which takes me to the national team. People that swan around on the public purse and our sponsor's purse at times, and I marsh, and yet do nothing. Don't work that hard, some of them, because they're good enough. It's not as though there's this massive pressure from below. Often distract those that are really trying to work hard, that really push the envelope, but do leave no stone unturned, despite our limited resources. And there are those skiers, and those coaches that work hard, but there's a lot that are not. Sport tourists, And it starts long before they get to the national team. We need to be engaging for the youngsters in this process. We need to tell the truth all the way through. This is tough. You're making progress. No, you're not. Here are the areas to work on. We will give you the tools to help you with that. We need to be inspirational. We need to find very different ways to capture kids' imaginations, to plant that seed, to light that fire, to help them with the dream, not discourage them at all. Even though we know it's a long, arduous journey, even for those that have gifts, even those that have the advantage of perhaps socioeconomic backgrounds as well, it's still tough to reach the top. starting to look and be creative to try to deal with the challenge, certainly coming out of Central and Eastern Europe, Spain. What are we going to do to rise to the occasion, to be more creative? I don't know. Don't have the answers. You're the community, you're the experts. You've got to allow yourself to really think openly around this. After all, a definition of insanity 
It's doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Skiing, Alpine, can do a great service to our youngsters who come through Alpine skiing domains as to where they go in the future, not just in skiing, by building character, by showing how hard it is, by rewarding effort, not simply the outcome, the process, because these are things that will stay with them for the rest of their lives, no matter what the pursuits that they go after. Many of the people that I see on the national team level are so fragile, we can hardly train them, not really in the grand scheme of things. And it starts decades before they may make a World Cup race. Thank you. 
trying to resist, much like you might see in certain elements of skiing. This is a young Austrian developmental skier. This was filmed around March, April in Christian Brasner's lab at the University of Innsbruck, the sport university there. Christian at uh, Innsbruck and also um, Eric Müller at Salzburg are the people responsible for the Austrian ski program. We have great contacts with them. We know exactly what's going on. Constantly innovating. This is all purpose-built equipment in their particular lab. I wonder how many of our athletes could even cope with that particular test and demand. This is what the world's best are doing. They are constantly moving forward, constantly evolving, constantly being students of their sport. <coughs> we cannot afford to lose one more second in falling behind these leading nations. No excuses. None. Not if we're serious. I apologize for the language, but I don't know what else to do.
потрясающе. So those are the Russians. I just spent three weeks at altitude in Medellin, Colombia, with the Canadians who are trying to chase them. They're currently lying in fourth place, competing in Guadalajara from yesterday, their Olympic qualifier. That four-minute routine at power outputs are greater than VO2 max, with three 20-second submerged components, including that last sequence where you saw the legs flashing around in the end. If you imagine skiing, downhill lasting four minutes, where there were three segments that you had to hold your breath for 20 seconds. Those young Canadian women, we were at the pool all 21 days, from 7 a.m. to 3 in the afternoon. They work. They understand these aspects. And that's who they're chasing. They have a clear understanding of the goal and the gap that they have to close. Do we have that same sense of urgency? Do we have that same understanding of what the pinnacle really looks like? The breakdown of the performance analysis. Canadians traditionally have been going three with 15 seconds through the course of a four, four minute, 10 second long program. They know that they have to get to three by 20. It has physiological aspects. It has obviously endurance components. So then there's the technical execution. Three meters deep, not allowed to touch the bottom. You saw the stacking to raise someone that weighs somewhere between 55 to 60 kilos out of the water, and at times doing pretty sophisticated areas. Great deal of respect. I wouldn't normally show synchronized swimming to other sports because it gets a sense of ridicule. But you need to understand how hard that is, the lengths they go to, and how hard they work. They deserve our respect. This particular book, I always like to give a reading to groups. It's written by a British table tennis player who's also a sport journalist. It's called Bounce. It's a very easy read. He talks about some of his understanding and some of his learnings around performance sport. How the Chinese coach that the British recruited revolutionized his way of thinking challenges that they went to, to change the way of thinking. I'll give you some examples. So I've managed to spend a lot of time, a lot of time, at a Beijing sport university. Over 10,000 people engaged in all facets of sport. Every single building on the campus in this immense has a singular purpose. The table tennis building, the volleyball building, the sports science building, the sport administration building the international dormitory, because there are a lot of international students there, the aquatics building. I went to watch the national team training volleyball one afternoon. And so the coach had them lined up and they were doing um, power digs or whatever it is, you know, where the ball was smashed down hard at them and uh, the guys that dig the ball out. And I've seen this drill performed at several venues across Canada, and typically what happens is the guy on the other side of the net has got to do the dig, okay? There's the coach standing on the box, so he doesn't have to jump at the time, he just hits five balls down, and then the next guy comes along and does it five balls down. No, 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 this is not how the Chinese did it. He had the whole team lined up behind him as the coach. And each guy came up, stood in that box, and smashed 10 shots, each one, the entire team, at one guy at a time. In the table tennis, he would play. They would have one guy, but he would play against two, three on the other side. So the reaction time was cut massively. Or they would have areas where they would cut out the table so that only the edge of the table actually remained. There was nothing in the middle. <laughs> so unless you got it within an inch of the outside of the table, each time it fell on the floor. The basketball team. We were on this offensive line on his first team. He would make them play. He made seven or eight defenders. Cut down the space. More traffic. They had to learn to play. Great 
demand all the time. Creative thinking. So where's our creative thinking around our plane scheme? From administration to the one we do on the snow. I hope I've given you lots of food for thought. As I said, I wasn't going to apologize for coming at you from a hard standpoint. If you're serious about anything to do with sport, from grassroots programming and being world leading and instilling in these youngsters both an amazing skill set but a love for this fantastic sport that they can carry through the rest of their lives no matter where their performance career goes. But by the same token, for that stream of individuals who have both the passion and the drive to pursue the highest levels of competition, I hope you really can push the envelope type of programming you're able to offer here. So thank you very much for listening. chasing down the soccer coach to find out what um, what he's doing, giving your kid a medal she didn't do anything? You know, it's, I, as I said, I, and my daughter now is uh, um, coming up to nine and my son is 12. I'm, I'm living the nightmare. Um, and uh, I mean, in the first few years, certainly we were trying to put them in absolutely everything we could. But sooner or later there comes a choice. And one of the most important aspects is the child's choice themselves. What we've tried to do is a little bit wherever possible is, um, is to uh, insist that they both have done gymnastics, I'm not talking about Olympic gymnastics, just a gymnastics course at least one semester every year um, up until the age of 12. And we made that the rule. We said if you want to do soccer, if you want to do hockey, you want to do these other things, you must do this once a year, you must do swimming once a year, whether it's a particular course or you join a summer club. We don't have to go to all the competitions, there are other things to do in the summer, but we're prepared to pay the money and understand that the cost goes up if you miss some sessions in the per session point of view. That has repercussions from an economic point of view. We've tried to do those type of things. The challenge, of course, is sooner or later you're faced with the fact that the whole minor sport association, no matter what the sport size, they rarely talk to each other and they rarely talk about scheduling that makes sense. And actually one of the things I'm going to be talking to um, Pacific Sport in, in Kamloops today about is uh, different scenarios. Can you imagine this? So if I put my son into, if he wants to play hockey in Cochrane minor hockey, as he does this year, and has done for a couple of years, he is basically locked into this sport from September all the way through to March, April, actually. And here's one of the really weird things. It's despite the fact he's only 12 now, so since he's been playing 9, 10, 11. Early March, they have their playoffs. Okay? So the very first weekend of playoffs, 50% of the kids will no longer be playing the next weekend. Okay? Even though there's still now three to four weeks easy of hockey season left, they're done because we have, as adults, this knockout system that goes on. And then the next weekend, then the last 50% are down, and 50% 50% every single weekend. So for the vast majority of March, the vast majority of kids in hockey, in Cochrane, are no longer playing. No longer playing. And that is purely down to the adults. Whereas if they had actually created a plate system so that everyone still, instead of having a knockout as a diamond doing this, a few and fewer teams, do you finally get to two, you just kept everyone still playing for you at least keep them going. But here's the other thing, of course. If we put them into hockey, that eradicates indoor soccer, basketball, volleyball, 
swimming, basically, unless you are prepared and find a program that will allow you to say, well, he's playing hockey, can he come like once a week? To which often the answer is, no! You come here or nothing. And so we hunt around, or we have to form our own little renegade group, and book time, and pay, often a lot of money, and try and coerce other parents to come along. We're going to run this, we're going to run badminton, and like-minded people. And so we've actually started, my wife as a volunteer, you can go online and see it, Sport for Life Cochrane, okay, as a guide and a resource for parents getting all the user groups to tell us what their programs are, dumped into one database so parents know what's going on, what are the costs, give them some understanding of what happens for growth and maturation through the formative years, blah, 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 blah. Usual stuff. But there's volunteers, because there's no help. And then you see really interesting things, like, Goal is being pulled in house hockey for a meaningless game, or one line being played for almost the entire last eight minutes of the game. Pathetic. Is this the children? Are they the ones making these decisions? No. It's us. Us. So you can imagine this. And it's easier in the smaller jurisdictions. Could you imagine if the entire minor associations got together and you said, you know what, we're going to take all the nine-year-olds in, say, the town of Cochrane, divide them in half, okay, for this particular year. One half between now and Christmas will do hockey three times a week. They will also swim once a week and do gymnastics once a week. The other half will also do the swimming once a week and gymnastics once a week, but they will do indoor soccer. And then after Christmas, the two main team sports will swap over, but still everyone will continue to do gymnastics and swimming. In the same six months period of time, you've now exposed the kids to four different systematic sports at that age group. And then for April and March, they could do something else, some field sports, and maybe they could all do the run, jump, throw, program of Athletics Canada, and then in July they could do something different, and in August they're off and everyone's going on vacation or going to the lake, or they just have fun doing other stuff. It's not structured. But we don't think of those things. We can do it. We can do it. We can make these kind of changes and do more effective programming. Sooner or later you have to make a choice about the streaming, but you want to equip the kids with lots of opportunity, so they are better equipped, a better skill set that they can move on. And you parallel that with education around healthy lifestyles and nutrition. You talk to any nutritionist who's dealing with six to seven year olds. Within a couple of sessions of dealing with those youngsters, they're starting to influence what their parents buy food wise. You can make a difference. Pretty simple. Now, Winsport in Calgary, we're going to be very aggressive about what we're going to try and do in Calgary. Very aggressive. We know we can't reach the entire one million population, but around any program to do with COP, Canada Olympic Park, the Campbell Nordic Centre, and the Olympic Oval, we are going to push the envelope hard and fast because we can. We control. We control programming. We control the quality of instruction. We're going to partner with any NSO that wants to partner with us. We're going to push them hard about the quality of their instruction and their long-term athlete development frameworks and constantly work to improve those. But we're going to try and do things. Summer and winter activities. You could do the same. Stand up to bullies. Don't let the assholes win. Thank you, Steve. We've got Richard Cocopan, who is kindly of offered to take his report. He's sitting on the side waiting because I just don't want you to miss your next plan. Thank you. <laughs> Stevie, thanks so much for coming. Thank you. It's been, as usual, uh, inspiring and thought provoking. Thank you. And at the same time, in two years. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Steve.
still hurrying back. it as well as uh, I'm going to use this one which will be higher quality and we'll see if we can post it up as a uh, better quality video afterwards. Yeah, it's